When I started this channel, I decided to maintain anonymity. At the time, I was still working regularly and didn't want evangelicals harassing the networks I reported for. But as this channel has become more popular, it seems my credentials are beginning to matter, and now that I plan to do a series on science and the media and inject some personal opinion, they are going to matter even more. So I've decided to come out of my comfortable cocoon of anonymity, strip away the cape, the leotard and the budgie smugglers, and reveal my identity. I'm sorry to say it won't be all that exciting, after all the speculation that's been going on. And here I am, at a media briefing circa 1993. But let's go back. I started writing for the British press in South America in the early 1980s, but news was scant, and British interest in the news from South America was even scanter. In 1986, I travelled to Japan and found my forte, writing humour. First for Punch, and then the Sunday Express and Private Eye. In 1992, Punch folded after a glorious 150-year history, but my association with Private Eye continued for another 12 years. In 1988, I was taken on as the Tokyo correspondent for Britain's Sunday Times newspaper. I also began writing freelance stories for New Scientist magazine. In 1989, the Tokyo correspondent for New Scientist left, and I took over the role. I continued writing for New Scientist for the next 16 years. In 1991, lured by the promise of a weekly column, I quit the Sunday Times and was poached by the Daily Mail. The column left me plenty of time to freelance. I teamed up with a photographer who I still consider to be one of the best in the Far East, Robert MacLeod, and began doing feature stories for Britain's so-called Sunday supplements, the Sunday Times magazine, the Observer magazine, and You magazine. In those days, they were the magazines every British writer aspired to. As more assignments came in, I found I was travelling more, first around Japan, and then to other parts of the Far East. How I got into broadcasting is a bit bizarre. I think it was 1992, and I was in the workroom at the Foreign Correspondence Club in Tokyo. A journalist answered the workroom phone, and it turned out to be Monitor Radio in Boston on the line, wanting someone to do a Q&A. I volunteered to do it, and afterwards Monitor Radio asked if I'd be their regular correspondent, first in Tokyo, then the Far East. If it weren't for the barbed wire and the secret police patrolling in odd-looking punts on the water, Aung San Suu Kyi's lakeside home would be the model of serenity. She was held prisoner here for seven years, until her release last year. Once people know your work in the media, offers start flooding in. So after a year with Monitor Radio, I was soon getting assignments from other radio networks. By the mid-90s, I was flying out of the country about once a month. That's why, behind the slopes that lead to this tranquil temple, hundreds of labourers are working to build tourist walkways and souvenir shops. Army trucks supply the raw material. Local people provide the labour. Peter, what would be next? What would the Japanese do after announcing this tax cut package? The big fight is not going to be economic. It's going to be political. The Prime Minister has to actually push this through Parliament. Now, to a certain extent, he's put his political reputation on the line because... We've been through the various processes. What are Kim Jong-nam's uh, relations like uh, with his father? He is, I suppose you might say, the favoured son. He is the son of... Kim Jong-il's first wife, who was a very famous uh, North Korean actress, and um, he's highly placed. He was working for North Korea's National Intelligence Agency for a year and a half. Political analysts say tension in the Japanese diet is now so high that Abuchi may be forced to dissolve parliament and call a general election. Peter Hadfield, BBC News, Tokyo. Through all of this, I was still filing regularly for New Scientist. Over the 16 years I worked for the magazine, I filed at least one story a week when I wasn't travelling. Sometimes it was just a small news piece, sometimes a major feature story that took a week to research and write. The science ranged from robotics and mechanical engineering to microbiology and geophysics. My work at New Scientist and my experience in radio soon led me to regular work with science programmes like the BBC's Science in Action and Australian Broadcasting's Science Show. Joining me to discuss these questions and others more intelligently phrased are three top science journalists. Joining us from Tokyo, Peter Hatfield. Hello, Peter. Yes, hello. From the Daily Telegraph in London, Roger Highfield, science editor of that august newspaper. <laughs> hello, Roger. Hello there. Pai sits back as his wife sells part of the catch to other villagers. 
Biologist Kent Hortle says the Mekong system is so complex that even one dam can have a major effect. By now, I had an arrangement with a broadcasting network and a newspaper in most English-speaking countries, except in the United States, where I was only working for radio. So I began writing for USA Today to fill the gap. The move into television also got off to a bizarre start. I got a call from the BBC show South Today. They knew my name through BBC Radio and asked if I had any experience in television. Having absolutely no experience at all, I told them, "Yes, of course." Well, it's all going off with remarkable precision, and that's hardly surprising. This isn't so much an exercise as it is a performance for the television cameras. Not surprising. Because- Inflating even this modest achievement more brazenly than a Tim Ball resume, I wormed my way into other TV networks. Since I was already CBC's radio correspondent, I was taken on as correspondent for CBC Television and did a weekly link with a BC-based program called Pacific Rim Report. After working on a documentary with WTN and Fuji Television, Fuji took me on as a sort of voice of the foreign media in Japan and invaded our home once a month to quiz me about whatever was the story of the day. And I became a kind of substitute teacher of the international airwaves, filling in for the bureau chiefs of other networks when they were overseas. The prime minister will find out just how much stomach the Japanese people have for the kind of harsh medicine he wants them to take. Peter Hadfield, CNN, Tokyo. A national BBC program called the John Dunn Show asked me to do a weekly Q and A. In 1994, John brought the whole show to Japan. From Oasis in the heart of Tokyo, and joining me here is the man who's been our eyes on Japan for so long, and to whom I've spoken so often on the phone, Peter Hadfield. Hello, Peter. Wonderful to see you. Hello, John. Yes, nice to see you in the flesh. In the flesh. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me about this imperial. When John Dunn retired in 1998, sadly the legendary broadcaster died a few years after that. The BBC bundled me off to Radio 2's Katrina Leskanich show to do a similar weekly Q and A. My relationship with USA Today ended in about 1998, when US News and World Report offered me a position as their correspondent. At about the same time, I ended my arrangement with the Daily Mail and became Tokyo correspondent for the Sunday Telegraph. I continued reporting after I moved to Australia in late 2001. They've been throwing everything they can at this latest fire, which has penetrated deep into suburban Sydney. In one area, the flames, up to 20 meters high, reached backyard fences before being turned by the wind. After a few minutes, ghostly grey shapes are silhouetted against the trees. Glover switches off the engine, trains his spotlight on the grazing kangaroos, and lifts his rifle. He's sitting down feeding. Straight through the head. See, instant death. Some of these rescued children would be lucky enough to return to their home countries and find work, using the skills they acquired here at Nontaburi. Others will have to cope with lingering trauma and, as often happens, abuse from friends and relatives. In the 24 years I've been reporting, a lot has changed in the Far East. When I started, most countries in the Far East were ruled by dictators. By the time I left, they were flourishing democracies. China opened up. Japan went from economic superpower to basket case. The last colonial outpost disappeared. Covering the region has been like travelling through the pages of a history book and helping write the text. Among the thousands of people I interviewed, the ones who impressed me most weren't the Hollywood celebrities or the politicians. The person who made the biggest impression on me was probably Han Dongfang, whom most people would never even have heard of. We spend so much time obsessed with the inconsequential lives of celebrities that the courage and tenacity of really extraordinary people go unnoticed. But I won't climb onto this hobby horse just yet. This channel will continue to focus on the accurate reading of science, and in the new series, I'll look at how the media report science and why they so often get it wrong.